Okay, so this is going to be today's uh, last lecture. And we talk about fluid properties, uh, some of the properties that are important when studying fluid mechanics. Uh, first one you're well familiar with is density. The symbol we use for density in the class is rho, Greek R. Uh, units for density in SI are kilograms per meter cubed. So I'm not going to say any more about that. I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with that one. Uh, it is a good idea when dealing with fluids to have a rough sense of what certain densities are uh, so that you can, um, you know, sort of get a sense for whether what you're looking up is right uh, and get a sense for how things would change with density. So I think it's a good idea for you to know as engineers that the density of water is basically uh, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And uh, that's really heavy, so that's the first thing to reckon, remember, is that water has a very, very high density. Um, and in addition, water's density does not change very much. And you know this from thermodynamics, that liquid water is uh, an incompressible fluid and compressible liquid, and therefore its density really doesn't depend much on anything. And it doesn't change much with temperature, it doesn't change much with pressure. Uh, water molecules are very closely uh, connected to each other in the liquid phase, and so they really can't uh, be compressed more uh, by adding pressure to them. So water's density is, is very, uh, pretty constant. Uh, air, on the other hand, has a much lower density, as you well know, approximately 1.25 kilograms per meter cubed. At, now, of course, with air, you have to specify temperature and pressure because air is a gas, and um, it's, as a gas, it's, Density is very dependent on both things. So I'll specify this one at one atmosphere and 20 degrees Celsius. Well, the density of air is about 1.25 kilograms per meter cubed. So that's a thousand times less dense than, than water. Uh, so that's a good thing to just bear in mind that air is you know, a thousand times less dense than water. Another important uh, parameter came up actually in that last bit is pressure. And we'll use P for pressure. Pressure, of course, is going to be uh, something that drives flow. You're familiar with the idea of uh, using a high-pressure pump. But at any rate, uh, the units for pressure are newtons per meter squared. Uh, this is newtons, of course, a force per meter squared. Uh, so pressure exerts force on surfaces and, of course, on liquids to make them move. If you convert that newton per meter squared to uh, standard SI units, uh, base SI units, it's kilograms per meter second. Uh, but it's really more useful to think of it as newtons per meter squared because it really is uh, pressure exerts force as a function of how much area is it is exp the, the pressure is it's pushing on. Uh, pressure exerts force normal to a surface. Um, so. Now, this doesn't have to be an actual physical surface, though, of course, it can be. Um, so it could be that there's a wall holding some liquid back, some fluid back, in which case that wall would experience an outward pressure. Uh, if there were you know, pressured liquid inside, it would act normal to the wall. But it also can just be a plane in the fluid flow. So pressure at one point in the flow will exert a force on the, flu on the fluid at that plane, and then you know, it's a, a different place. It could exert that force normal to the, to a plane in a different direction. Uh, anyway, but you need to calculate the force sometimes. The force is equal to uh, very simply the pressure times the area. That the it was the area of the surface, of course, area of the surface. So that's your um, pressure, and again, you're familiar with pressure. But it's an important, important property for fluid mechanics. Uh, another important property that you're certainly well familiar with from thermodynamics and, uh, and other things such as chemistry is temperature. So T is temperature. Um, we'll have temperature uh, will show up in a couple of different ways for us. We'll use Kelvin. We'll also use Celsius. We won't use silly English units. Um, so we'll be looking at Kelvin and Celsius for that. Um, 
it'll matter to us because uh, initially, you know, temperature can of course affect properties. So in some ways, the only thing temperature will do in early phases of the class will just be might change the properties of some of the fluids because of many of the properties are uh, temperature dependent. Um, and then later in the class, we might get to some natural convection. And natural convection is is what happens when a fluid gets warm, that it's, it actually expands, it becomes less dense, and that causes an upward flow. Um, or if it gets cold, it becomes more dense, and that causes a downward flow. So we probably will get to that later in the class, but we won't study it too much. All right, so all of these properties are assumed assume that the fluid is continuous, um, that they aren't changing from spot to spot with, at the sort of local level. So obviously these properties can change within a flow field, but we're saying that, you know, if you say the density of the air is 1.25 kilograms per meter second, if you move one millimeter over, uh, you know, the density isn't necessarily going to change. More importantly, it's not changing due to molecular effects. So we're assuming the fluids are continuous we're assuming fluids can be treated as continuous media. Now we know that's not actually true. I mean, there are molecules in all of these fluids. And so of course, it's really the case that there are voids in between the molecules and, and it's not a purely continuous uh, uniform substance, but it can be treated as a uniform substance. And so what we want to say essentially is that, you know, we're not interested in length scales that are down at the molecular level. So we are going to treat the fluids as if as continuous media, um, which means to so treat fluids as continuous media means the uh, physical features of the flow are greater, significantly greater, than the distance between molecules. All right, so we're saying that, you know, we can study flow in a pipe or flow over, you know, flow in the sky or over a wing. Because this dimension of the pipe and the dimension of the wing are much, much greater than the intermolecular distances. So from the perspective of the wing or the pipe, the fact that there are a bunch of small molecules is really irrelevant. They're just too small to be uh, considered. But there are some flows where that's not the case. So there's flow in a rarefied gas. Um, so... Flows of rarefied gas, I'll spell that again so you can read it, rarefied gas, um, have intermolecular distances that are greater than the flow features. So what is a rarefied glass? Well, rarefied gas is a glass that is very, not very dense at all, that in fact has relatively few molecules. As we know, gases, as we discussed last lecture, will expand to fill any space. So if you only have 10 gas molecules in a large volume, you're gonna have very large gaps between those molecules. And that would be an example of a rarefied gas. So it still is a fluid, and you can study it as a fluid, but it's not going to be a continuous fluid. That's going to be treated as essentially separate gas molecules. Um, so the rarefied gases have intermolecular distances that are greater than flow features. So you're looking at situations where um, you know, the distance between the molecules is quite significant compared to uh, the features you're looking at. This can also, of course, uh, not be a continuous system if the flow features you're interested in um, so it can be not continuous or not continuous if the flow features you are trying to study are as small as the intermolecular distances. So 
what does that mean? Well, that means, you know, what if you're studying something really tiny, right? You could be studying, um, you could be studying flow over other molecules or a little, you know, an intermolecular ridge, um, some, you know, metal situation where you have a layer of platinum on top of a layer of gold and you're flowing, you know, air over it. Well, the, you know, if it's one molecular layer of thickness, then the intermolecular uh, distance between the gas molecules is probably going to be greater or the same size as the as the flow feature you're purportedly studying. So that's another example where you know it can't be continued continuous. It's not continuous if the flow features that you were trying to study are as small as the intermolecular distances. So you have to be careful uh, when you're going to very very small features that you could be violating what's called continuum fluid mechanics. But in this course, we are only going to study continuum fluid mechanics. So this course, this course will study only what's called continuum fluid mechanics. So we will not be dealing with flows where either the spatial scales are so small that we have to worry about intermolecular distances because we're down at molecular leg scales, nor will we be dealing with rarefied gas. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. That raises the question, however, of, um, you know, what kind of flows can we study in a continuum world? And so, um, So in continuum mechanics, the relevant flow lengths are much greater than the distances between molecules, but are there flows we might study, therefore, that would be too small? And when would, when would that be? So one example of a flow that I have studied in my life uh, is the flow of, of water in and out of mammalian cells. So a typical mammalian cell... is roughly a sphere with a diameter of about 10 microns, so 10 micrometers. Uh, and the question we could ask is, uh, can water flow in and out of a cell be considered continuum fluid mechanics? So uh, can water flow in a cell be treated as continuum fluid mechanics? And that's a question that I'm going to uh, let you uh, think about. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and do that? Um, so turn off, we're going to turn off this video, uh, and I'm going to let you think about how you would decide whether a uh, 10 micrometer cell full of water, cells are full of water, uh, whether the flow inside that cell can be treated as a continuum, or whether that small size, a very tiny cell, um, size of a human hair, maybe that's too small, and maybe we won't have enough molecules in that cell in order for us to really consider it to be a, uh, a continuum. Okay, and we'll finish that up next lecture.